good morning, everyone, and um, good evening to those that are joining us from the Southern Hemisphere. My name is Carissa Andrew-Smith uh, from Pony in the UK. And um, firstly, may I ask everyone to please um, turn off your cameras if you haven't already done so. Um, as we're collaborating with Australia for the Confluence Project, we're going to start today with a special, special welcome to country. So I'd like to introduce Jacob Morris of the Gamia Darawal um, to do this. So thank you very much, Jacob. I'd like to um, get going. Uh, thank you. Um, a bit strange to do welcome to country when I'm uh, actually on country, but I'll give it a go anyways. <laughs> um, more of a welcome to this meeting and acknowledgement of uh, my country and everyone else's that's doing as well. Uh, the language I do is to me a Daru, which is the southern dialect of Daru on the east coast of New South Wales. So with our village on Yindi, Langang, Birungame, Daru, and Tarumba, Turuki, you and Birupa, Jangu, Guru, Yuan, Dying with Daru, Langang, Gamang, Gurung, Langang, Gamang, Gurulang, Langang, Gamang, Magada, Balai, Gamala, Bulu, 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 I'm um, a proud to meet Daru Men, Wandu Wandi, Wabanja Turiga, Virapa Dangari, Northern Newan, and Southern Daru. I acknowledge the countries, uh, mine and yours. Uh, I acknowledge the elders, past, present, and future, uh, yesterday, today, tomorrow's, and I'd like to welcome you all to this meeting. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Um, that was wonderful. And I'm sure it was of particular interest to our Northern Hemisphere audiences as well. Um, so we're here today as part of Confluence, which is a multifaceted 18-month project, which is exploring the meaning and implications of climate change across multiple viewpoints to hopefully activate a shared imagination for the future. Uh, the past eight months has focused on knowledge exchange and research and development where we've been fortunate to speak to a wide range of experts from both hemispheres in concert with our lead partner, Bundanon in Australia and the Cabot Institute for the Environment in the UK. We've collected a plethora of ideas, provocations and questions to rethink the climate status quo, language and framing, to build solidarity and share new narratives, which has underscored the immense value of cross-disciplinary co collaboration and new ways to devise tactics for collective gain and structural transformation. Today's symposium is the second of four key project activities, which is delivered in association with the UK Australian Season Partners, the British Council, and the Australian Government's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I'd like to now briefly introduce our esteemed panel of speakers. So here in the UK, we have Dr. Andy Flack, an environmental historian, University of Bristol and co-chair of the European Society for Environmental History Conference, which is happening this July in Bristol. Dr. Tommaso Juca, Merck Research Fellow, lecturer at the School of Biological Sciences, University of Bristol and, Bristol, and founder of Solva Lab. And one of Tommaso's recent projects has focused on Western Australia in collaboration with the CSIRO. Professor, Professor Daniela Smith, Professor of Paleobiology, University of Bristol, Professor at the School of Earth Sciences and Cabot Institute. Her research focuses on the causes and effects of climate change on marine socio-ecological systems. She's the coordinating lead author of IPCC6 Assessment, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, the United Nations body for assessing the science related to climate change. Many of you may have read the results of this important report over the past fortnight as it's received major press coverage across the world. And our three speakers joining us from Australia, Mrs. Lee Carr, Wiradjuri woman and Aboriginal language teacher with the New South Wales Education Standards Authority and the Australian National Curriculum, who also works leading indigenous stories, traditions and culture in Sydney for organizations, including the Royal Botanic Garden, Caldo Public Art Projects and the Song Room. Jacob Morris, Gamia Darawal of the Gundagul Murring, a poet, language holder, and educator. And lastly, but not least, Sophie O'Brien, Head of Curatorial and Learning at Bondanon, who's previously worked in senior curatorial leadership roles at Serpentine Galleries and Tate Britain, and led the exhibition teams for the Australian Pavilions at the Venice Biennale and the Biennale of Sydney. 
I'll be asking um, three questions to our panel today, and we invite all audiences to send through their own questions via the chat function, and we'll get through as many of those as time permits. So um, we're obviously experiencing a situation where the entire planet has become conscious of the human race's vulnerability and its interdependence with the natural world. This is particularly poignant right now in Australia where catastrophic floods have wiped out entire communities. So I'd like to start by um, addressing our panel and asking them to discuss how the natural world is communicating with us about the climate crisis, um, the language of nature itself. So da Daniela, perhaps you could start by sharing your thoughts. I think it's important that we all reflect on the changes we have already seen because we are all witness to the changes in nature. We see earlier appearance of species in the, during the year or they're leaving where we live earlier. We see the impacts of droughts and heat and fire. And we've seen fire extending into areas where it isn't natu naturally managed or hasn't been historically managed by the peoples who live on um, the island. And also, um, in areas where we have never experienced fires before. We see that the world around us is changing and nature is autonomously responding by, change, by migrating, by changing timing of development. And often we don't reflect on that. We don't see that as clearly as we should. We do see it in extreme events. We see it when droughts and heat come together. We see it when the grass around us turns brown, when the forests don't have enough water and the trees start to wilt away. We also have recorded, and predominantly in Australia, the first extinctions of species due to climate change. Extinctions are something we have caused ever since populations have increased so much, but now we can attribute them to climate change. And I had to write it down so that I don't get it wrong. One of the first is the Brumbulkoi melomi, which um, is a mammal living on one of the islands in the Great Barrier Reef, as one of the first species attributed its extinction to climate change, to sea level rise, which has reduced the habitat and the, and the storms going over those islands. There are very few of those examples to date, but we know that the risk is increasing. And so it's for us to reflect on those increasing indications of losses and the damages to the natural environment. And we can see those with the bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef. We can see it in the Northern Hemisphere with the losses of our kelp forests and our seagrass meadows. We can see this all around the world. And that was one of the main messages from the report which we have published last week is that impacts on the natural world can be seen all across the world. One of the other things this report last week wanted to highlight though is the strong interdependence of nature and humans. The need we have to consider how we can support nature to support us. Supporting nature to you know, clean air, clean water, coastal protection, livelihoods, mental health benefits we gain from being out in nature. And that we can just do this if we also give nature space to breathe and give it space, water, land to exist. And the importance this has for us in making decisions that protecting and the stewardship and the stewardship often you know connected with the people who live in those smaller regions so we need to draw in on both the indigenous people's knowledge all across the world as well as the local knowledge of those communities who live there and who can therefore tell us a story of those changes, but also take stewardship of the protection. The projections we have on future climate change are really quite overwhelming in terms of the numbers of species and the percentage of species we are projected to lose. So we have no choice other than finding solutions 
for this ongoing combined biodiversity and climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Taniela. Um, Tomasa? Yeah, um, it, it's going to be quite hard for me to add much to what Daniela has just said or, or put it more eloquently, to, to be perfectly frank. Um, <laughs> but when I think about how the fingerprint of climate change and, and what we see in an everyday life, I mean, we I think it's it's almost inescapable that you're not, we all notice things like spring coming slightly earlier every year or autumn coming slightly later and the fact that our winters are slightly warmer. We're not seeing those kind of extreme periods of, of cold, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and so that, that fingerprint is sort of, we're reminded of it on a long-term basis. And that obviously has implications for, uh, for when plants flower and for when uh, uh, resources are available for animals uh, to forage on or to eat. And those inter complex interactions that are sort of so tightly bound by by the by the phenology and the timing of, of things uh, sort of start to break down. Uh, so when when insects decide to come out and when the timing of that, uh, how that's timed to uh, when flower resources are available or when fruits are, are, are available and all those kind of things. So those long term trends is something that I think we, we've all sort of sort of started to notice and, and we can see. But I think one thing that strikes me and it maybe it's because I it's because of my focus uh, my, my research in, in forests uh, is is the is the sort of the change in this and the frequency and intensity of these extreme events um, and so they might not happen every year and we might not notice them uh, uh, as, as much although they, they tend to be in the news more more frequently than not uh, Risa obviously Australia at the moment is going through uh, uh, one such event with these floods but just a few years ago you were going through the exact opposite with uh, raging fire and I, I remember leaving Australia uh, just as that that was going on and just being struck by the by the scale of it. Um, and I think that it's a it's what what we what what nature doesn't quite have is uh, or isn't used to is the is the or the ability to sort of adapt and bounce back from the from these events if they start happening more and more frequently and in a way that's more and more intense. Uh, so Daniela spoke about examples of, of things like uh, uh, like fire. Fire is a, is, is a, is a, is a great example. Uh, drought is, a, is another one and they're often interlinked with, uh, with fire. We're seeing that in Australia, but we've, we've seen that in Europe as well. We've gone through back-to-back -back years in 2018 and 2019 of sort of extreme dry, hot summers, uh, and they've 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 sort of they, we're starting to see the effects of those uh, sort of tipping points. Certain species are, are, are no longer able to sort of cope. We see ma mass die-offs of particular species of tree, which are key for for ecosystems but also key for people in terms of providing resources and providing uh, sort of uh, for, for economics. Um, and so these, these these extreme events are are something that I think is going to is going to play a bigger and bigger role going forward. We're going to start to notice this, and this is one of the 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 the, the fingerprints that we're going to start to see um, from a climate change perspective. Brilliant, thank you, Tomaso. Um, Lee, perhaps you'd like to share some of your thoughts from Australia. You need to unmute yourself. Yes. Um, well, Tommaso has given me a nice little segue into um, my thoughts um, with his comment of spring coming early, because Aboriginal stories developed over thousands of years of observation have always reflected on the, cons the consistently recurring patterns of plants and animals within a corresponding time frame. But as time passes, the stories are becoming less and less accurate because of the increasing changes to the Earth's natural systems. And this is proving to be a challenge as Aboriginal peoples have relied on these rhythms to live beneficially and harmoniously for thousands of years. An example of the Earth communicating with us is what we call indicator plants. Indicator plants communicate what is happening in related ecosystems. So for instance, various species of wattle when in bloom indicate it's the right time to collect a certain food. They indicate the time and place to hunt a particular animal. Now we are seeing the plants are confused. Um, they're blossoming earlier, their messages are out of sync, which means their instructions to us are distorted. 
So changes to climate have significant, sorry, significantly altered the visual language and the behavioural maps on which we have always relied. Well, thank you, Lee. Um, really amazing. Um, perhaps we could hear from Andy now. Sure. So, I, I mean, I, <clears throat> I can't say too much. I don't think that's already uh, been not already been said. Um, so maybe I'm going to talk a bit about my my own research and how I think um, looking historically at kind of human animal relations and relations with the environment can can help us to um, to communicate uh, with the natural world or to, to to hear their communications around the climate crisis. So it's become clear that over the past couple of decades, nocturnal nature or nature by night has, has started to send signals uh, that all is, all is not well in the nighttime world. Recent research has shown that, um, that creatures that usually live during the day are increasingly adapting their behaviors to increasingly habit, inhabit the nighttime hours. The nighttime is cooler generally, and there is less human activity. So the, the shape of, of the way in which the natural world, according to the rhythms of light and dark, has started to change. But there's also research emerging at the same time, showing that the night seems to be warming more quickly than the day. So looking historically, we're reading this changing language of nocturnal nature and seeing these fundamental reconfigurations and the two of them together the warming of the night and the movement into the night present really potentially quite disturbing, but still largely fairly unacknowledged uh, communications or signals from a natural world that is changing really quickly. We can also read the language of nature or listen for the language of nature by listening for absence or listening for silence. So one of my favorite uh, books um, at the moment is Michael McCarthy's The Moth Snowstorm and it's a nostalgia piece in which the author recalls the, the clouds of insects that would splatter his car windscreen uh, during um, his drives down country lanes in the 1970s but he argues that over the past couple of decades there have been what he calls a great thinning a precipitous decline in the quantities of, no of nocturnal insects um, in those sorts of places. A reduction of the volume, a kind of turning down of the volume of the, of the language of nature, I suppose, in, in, in this great thinning. Across both of these contexts, I think, both relating to the night, I think we need to do much more to learn the languages of nocturnal nature. A 2019 paper by life scientist Kevin Gaston noted that we still have a major nocturnal problem in the life sciences. More than 60% of all species are either nocturnal or crepuscular, and yet we still have not developed effective ways of really studying and understanding the way in which that world is working. And given, I think, that, that we're starting to understand the way in which that world is potentially changing quite radically, um, I think we need to do much more to learn that language of nature, the language of nature by night. Brilliant. Thank you, Andy. And Jacob, I'd love to hear your thoughts to finish off this question. Yeah, well, I haven't done um, much research or read any books on climate change, but um, what I, I can talk about is the, uh, the language of uh, nature. So for me, the language of nature, if you need to understand that, then you need to first speak to translators, and the translators are indigenous and first nation people. Um, People, you know, can do a 10 year study, 20 year study, but you know, the First Nations Indigenous people from around the world have done thousand year studies, uh, thousand, thousand generation year studies. And so it's knowledge that um, needs to be uh, recognized for what it is. Um, I can sit here and be talk in this panel and I only know a fraction of what my ancestors and my old people have done. And so unfortunately, when I'm um, Time was uh, not so long ago when people were going around uh, colonizing invading um, different countries. The knowledge was lost because it wasn't seen for what it was at the time. Um, and now going back 
couple hundred years later around the world, people starting to realise like oh, what we had and that I was saying you don't know what you've got until it's gone. And so there's still that chance of we're still going. So um, for me, to people to fully understand the, the language of nature, um, they have to speak to the translators, the people that have been living in nature for the longest. Um, that can tell you about the changes um, from a long time ago to what they are now and through the stories what they were thousands of years ago as well so yeah yeah um completely agree with you there jacob thank you um so a second question uh, for everybody when we're looking at discussing climate change and jacob's just sort of touched on this actually how important are stories when we're looking at um communicating about climate change rather than talking about or in addition to facts and figures. So Andy, perhaps you could talk about your research and um, touch on that. Yeah, sure. So in my view, as a, as a humanities scholar, um, all I do is tell stories, really. And I, I think the stories are absolutely critical to building an engagement with with nature and particularly a changing nature. So my sense is that the kinds of stories we tell drawn from or the stories I tell drawn from history and literature are vital for building um, a relationship um, built up based on experience between people and nature and for building and preserving, um, I think, in particular, a collective memory um, of what once was. And I think that's important. It's not only it's not only therefore Kind of explaining what once was here but but attaching meaning to it and stories are really good for attaching that meaning once kind of memories are, are gone then the baseline for what is normal in the world shifts in a population and so in our context a certain level of absence um, or an increasing level of absence it becomes the baseline for what people think is 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 normal in the world so i think stories are really important for for preserving the fact that the, that baseline changes. Oral histories in particular are crucial for gathering stories about the past, about people and about places, about phenomena, things that happen in the world that are no longer or which happen differently, or which exist in a diminished form. Others may have more to say about that than I do it shortly. But written stories and oral histories make that world relatable because we we can position ourselves in a world that feels different so one thing that one piece of work that i've read or worked with recently is a is the journal of a night naturalist written written by a, a woman called chris ferris in the 1980s and chris ferris spent night after night after night for five or six years wandering the darkness communing with a thriving world learning the the byways and the thoroughfares of the forest and the field and her writing brings to life a side of nature that we don't often encounter. She brings absent nature, nature of the night, but I think we can also apply this to nature of the past, nature um, that is no longer. Bring these forms of nature to life and allows us to imagine ourselves there. And I think, I think this is really important. Stories can help us to imagine possible uh, other worlds, uh, possible um, worlds that we can aspire to create and that therefore can inspire uh, action in the face of catastrophic um, threat, I think. Thank you, Andy. Sophie, would you like to talk about um, Bundanon's perspective for this? Yes, thanks, Carissa. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm, I'm sitting in a, um, an office that sits on in, in the museum, which sits on Wadi Wadi country. And I'd like to acknowledge all of the people who are here today who are First Peoples, but also the great cultural and knowledge histories that um, we are so lucky to have around us here at Bundanon. Um, we've got a huge number of communities who feed into a knowledge base at Bundanon, and we hope that that will increase, which actually allows us um, to uh, build into our programs a whole variety of modes of storytelling. And um, I guess from the art point of view, of course, uh, Bundanon was founded by a well-known Australian artist, Arthur Boyd, and his, his partner, Yvonne Boyd. Um, and I think one of the things Arthur prized more than anything is that art is a mode of storytelling which allows you to see um, 
certain perhaps facts, perhaps emotions, phenomena, whatever they might be, in um, from a different perspective. And I think our residency program invites artists to do that. But one of the wonderful things about Bundanon is that it might invite all different modes of storytelling from a scientific perspective, from a creative practices point of view. I mean, in a way, creative practice could be everyone on this in this conversation today, we could count as a creative practitioner. Um, the role of the artist or that that um, storyteller um, can be seen as one that really is about attention, a critical thinking about a phenomena, a fact, a, a feeling, um, a sensation. It can be as abstract or as um, uh, visceral uh, is the full degree of those things. But is I think constructing those stories or new ways of reflecting upon the world around us, Bundanon has the opportunity to bring all of those modes together. And I think that's certainly our ambition um, and to do that with uh, certainly a first, a first people's a uh, related perspective as a core part of what we do. Um, but in a way, categorization is maybe something that art allows us to unpick. So that who, who, which is what is science and what is art might be unpicked in some way so that knowledges can sit together. I mean, it sounds very ambitious, I know, but um, that's always the role of the museum is to promote these things. So I think that attention to detail, that attention to um, an engagement with reality is something that is not uh, either particularly sentimental or um, necessarily non-factual, but it is rather about um, encountering the current, the contemporary, and thinking through how we might internally or through external action um, change things, um, act or um, enact things and how we might connect as a community to do those things. So the potential of Bundanon, I guess, is that it can be a platform for these conversations. Wonderful, thank you, Sophie. Um, perhaps Lee could, I mean, I'm sure, yeah, Australian First Nations, Lee and Jacob have some great insights on this question. So perhaps Lee could start and respond first. Well, Aboriginal peoples' oral histories have taught knowledge, law, and customs through story and songs for millennia. Each geographic area, and there are quite a number in Australia, um, hold its own stories or song lines uh, due to the different connections that peoples have with various animals and seasons. Song lines are shared between peoples, told or sung, and this valuable knowledge has been passed down through many, many generations. Educating and entertaining young children, the information that is learnt through repeated hearings of the stories becomes vital knowledge for survival as individuals mature, because song lines describe how to traverse dreaming trails, how to um, traverse trade routes or locate a waterhole or other vital resource. Uh, for instance, a story um, inspired by the pelican describes how stones have traditionally been used to catch fish. One set known as the Barorana fish traps is a com complex network of river stones and stone walls arranged to form channels which guide fish to and hold them in ponds as they travel up or downstream. This was an important site of food production, work, trade and consumption. And the creation of these fish traps um, really sort of um, governed um, Aboriginal law, helped shape the spiritual, political, social, ceremonial and even trade relationships between Aboriginal groups across the greater landscape. As part of the Murray-Darling River system, these traps have always been adaptable to seasons and changing water levels of the river. However, current water licences have disturbed the natural river patterns. By allowing mining corporations and other large, often international even, commercial entities rights to divert water from the rivers to support their activities, the water levels in the Barwon River have been severely depleted 
exacerbating severe drought conditions downriver um, over, over a number of years prior to this current flooding. In 2019, an estimated 10,000 fish died following heavy rainfall. Local Aboriginals believe topsoil contaminated with 30 years of pesticides from local cotton crops was eroded and carried by the floodwaters into the river, resulting in the death of the fish, water spiders and other aquatic fauna and flora. Floods similar to what we're seeing right now across New South Wales can cause rivers to be redirected. As waters find a new way to proceed past the blockages caused by silt buildup, the river is suddenly set on a new unnatural course. We believe the increasing impacts of climate change and extreme weather events is nature's way of trying to protect herself, in a way sharing her own story, telling us to restore the balance to the environment. Thank you, Lynn. That was lovely. Um, Daniela, perhaps we could get back over to the UK and hear your thoughts about sharing stories in regards to communicating information about climate change. For me, it's really important that we don't forget that there's a lot of emphasis trying to remove this dichotomy between scientific information and oral histories. There's been a huge emphasis in the climate report, which came out last week, to respect the ownership of Indigenous oral histories, but still draw on them, which, for, of course, for many of us is is a really difficult um, path to tread. And so, for example, the Europe chapter, which I led, has um, describes the impact climate change had on the Sami, um, a group of Indigenous uh, people in in Northern Europe, who herd reindeer and therefore are dependent on the land, on the vegetation, on the snow. But in the same time, respecting that the oral history behind it is theirs. And that's a really difficult thing for us to learn. What I consider important, though, is to widen this to local narratives everywhere. How often do we sit down with our elders and have a chat about you know, climate and the, you know, the Brits in here who are old enough, I live in the Southwest. Um, everyone still talks about this huge, huge snow in the 1960s where everyone was snowed in for several months. And, you know, in the UK and especially in the Southwest, that's, that's unheard of. But it's important to hear those stories and it's important to hear those stories of change. At the same time, it's also important to, to empower the young generation to have their own voices. And one of the projects we are doing is to use animation um, and give young people, therefore, a way to reduce the anxieties many of them feel um, about climate change and the impact it has and biodiversity loss and the impact it has and allow them to be more proactive. And so we've, we've gone out to a community in the Southwest, children who meet their friend at the beaches and therefore are really um, impacted by seeing sewage, seeing pollution, um, hearing about climate change. And by teaching them how to make an animation, little stop motions, we have we've given them the option to make a film and get that film seen at one of the green events at the Conference of Parties in Glasgow last autumn. They felt incredibly empowered. And again, you know, we have other opportunities where this film can be seen. It allows them to become agents. And it allows them to not just feel the fear, but positively do something and, and have their voice heard. Thank you, Daniela. Jacob, love to hear your thoughts on, on stories. Um, yeah, well, everyone, uh, it sounds like we're all talking about the same thing. Everyone touched on what I would like to talk about as well. And um, with stories, you know, um, Andy mentioned that it's, it's personal. That's what the great things about stories are. And um, even Daniela mentioned then, like, hearing stories from her grandparents. So, like, those are still stories and they're personalized as well. 
And even like we go back to our dream time stories, um, when we tell them to the kids, that's the imagination they put themselves in those places. And so stories is an awesome way of communicating from things from the past, that knowledge. Um, me and my colleagues, my uh, family, we, when we work in the schools, uh, we don't uh, really like using the word dream time story because for young children, when you hear the word dream time, it either means that it puts them to sleep or it was made in their sleep. So therefore it's fantasy. Um, dream time stories aren't fantasy. They, they are based in fact. Um, and that's what, um, and yeah, more and more the science is backing that up. They're working together and coming forward. And that's the best way. That's, it's, it backs us up as well. It makes our thing of our old people, yeah, we knew what we were talking about. When the science even goes, yeah, actually, you are right. That did happen. So it's like, it, it's the awesome thing when that happens. Um, and you can learn from the stories as well. Um, you know, we got a story here on the South Coast um, it's about the arrival of the Darul, the, um, the language of the, um, of the cabbage farm people. And it's a story about how the, they stole the whale's canoe and the animals came over and the only thing they bring was the cabbage farm. That story, um, me and my family, we believe that that relates to the um, milk from the last ice, um, ice age. So that was 12, 000, 12 and a half thousand years ago. Um, there's another story in the far south coast about a big flood that came up and washed and washed away the whole tribes. And there was only a couple of people that ended up on the mountain that washed up the mountain. So those stories as well, the kids hear that and they can see that person alive again, that there is trauma, there is bad, there is sad things that happen. And those stories, they already happened to, for us to learn from. The thing with stories is that um, what Annie Lee was saying as well, you know, it's about our structure, our life as well. It's not about our society, it's not just about a story, it's the way of teaching the children about how to live a good life, how to connect with country, how to respect country, and make sure that everyone thrives as well. Um, not just the people, the land. How, what I've been taught by my elders is that we, the land isn't here for us, we are here for it because we call the land Mother Earth. You don't own mum, you can't own mum. If you do, she uh, yeah, flogs her, <laughs> you get in trouble. And that's what we're seeing right now. So, yeah. Lovely, Jacob. And actually, you're just, you know, it's interesting because in the last eight months, we have been um, speaking to a whole sort of range of people. And over and over again, it's really interesting, just like you said, that this, you know, modern science, whatever it's like you said, catching up. Um, you know, they say that, you know, Aboriginal, it's the oldest scientists in the world. So it's nice to see, hopefully, we can see more collaboration in that space moving forward for everybody sharing that knowledge. Um, on that, Tommaso, who's been doing a lot of work in Western Australia, would you like to finish off about um, stories when we discuss climate change? Yeah, so I, actually picking off on what Jacob just said, I think you, 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 you've nailed it there. Um, I think there's this false dichotomy that somehow scientists don't tell stories, that sometimes the, somehow we're using uh, data or something to and we're using it in some analytical way which is sort of separate from stories but in fact all we do is tell stories we're just using data or figures to build those stories and understand what's going on but like what I do every day is sit down and think about stories how things work and and sort of building a narrative because if you don't have that narrative then there's absolutely no way you're going to engage anyone and make them Sort of, uh, sort of believe that what you're doing is important and something needs to needs to happen. Um, so that those those stories are essential. And as Jacob was saying, we're just catching up. We're just a few thousand years behind. Um, so hopefully, in a couple thousand years, you come back to speak to us, and we'll we'll <laughs> we'll be back on par. Um, one thing that I wanted to pick up on this when I was getting the prompt for this question, I was thinking, what could I contribute here uh, in terms of like how scientists interact with the with the general public and sometimes through media? I think that one thing that I think we can do a lot better at as scientists is communicating some of the nuance of some of these stories around climate change. Um, and so I thought I'd and, and I think it goes back to the, the, this idea that we're always trying to reduce stories. Uh, from a scientific perspective uh, to the lowest common denominator. We're trying to make it as simple as possible because there's somehow this idea that if we communicate a concept that's not quite linear, people won't get it. And I, I strongly reject that. I don't think that's true at all. I think people, if explained properly, can understand the complexities of some of these problems. So I wanted to pick on one example in particular, which is one that we see in the media 
quite a lot uh, in uh, lately in this idea of, so we have climate change, we know it's happening, what are we gonna do about it? Uh, and one of the solutions that gets thrown out a lot from a sort of a, an environmental side of things is, well, why don't we plant a whole bunch of trees? Um, and the idea is, well, we plant trees, trees grow, they uh, accumulate carbon, and that carbon is stored up in that tree for its whole life, uh, and we're removing that carbon from the atmosphere. Um, and we're, we're, we've seen a few very high profile sort of scientific publications come out in the last few years that have sort of advocated for this. And when it trickles down to sort of like the media, you'll open the Guardian or the BBC and you'll read that article and something like you'll read something along the lines of, oh, the mind blowing potential of planting trees to save, save the world. And in that process, we've lost all of the nuance of that, of, of the difficulty of doing that. Of firstly, we've lost the nuance of where should we be planting trees? There's plenty of places in the world where we should absolutely not be, be planting trees. Uh, there's large places, there's a swath of Australia where we probably should not be planting trees. Those are naturally grassland ecosystems where trees are, 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 not, the, are not the solution or not what we should be doing. We see that in uh, sort of high latitudes in the, in the sort of northern hemisphere, like places like peat bogs where people have planted trees on them to drain them. And what happens to all the carbon that's stored in the soil there? So we're losing that nuance. We're also losing the, losing the nuance around like what tree species should we be planting? Uh, and I think that we can communicate that to the people can understand that if you walk around a landscape, you'll notice that some trees are in some places and some other species are found in another place. And there's a reason for that. Uh, and we can't just blanket plant one species across an entire landscape. We need to be much more nuanced about how we do that. And so I think that there's, we need to, we need to be able to communicate some more science in that nuanced perspective so that we don't actually end up doing more harm than good in implementing some of these big scale changes that we're thinking about to sort of uh, uh, help with climate change. Thanks, Thomas. So, I mean, that's really interesting. And that touches on the next question, which is, you know, how can we contribute to a more sustainable future? I mean, what you're saying is that we're often, especially when you're talking about someone like a member of the public through the media, as you said, with, there's so much messaging going on, and it's hard to almost um, prioritize or understand what is actually maybe greenwashing, what is actually practical advice. So, um, perhaps, I don't know, Sophie, from an arts point of view, perhaps you could touch on that about you know, how Bandanon is looking or prioritizing or um, communicating or exhibiting about um, contributing to a more sustainable future. Yes, I mean, Bandanon's uh, unique in, in many ways. One of the um, things is the bringing together of a big learning program. And of course, Carissa, you've been working with the learning team in this project itself in Confluence. Um, but that, 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 that has an ambition of being not only for um, necessarily um, preschool aged children, school and tertiary aged people, but also all ages learning, tying together histories of art, but also histories of the environment. Uh, we have a carbon farm, we've got a functioning farm, to some degree. Um, and uh, we've got homesteads that are colonial homesteads as well, of course, of about a thousand, a thousand hectares of um, beautiful bushland, which has, has its own, um, uh, in a way, topography and different plants in different places, which Jacob would be able to speak about much more in detail than I would. So I won't touch on that. But I guess we as a team in this office can offer the um, structure of um, a program that can be uh, focused to learning, focused to artists in residencies, focused to exhibitions or performance programs or public presentations that might bring those things together. Um, all of this really speaks to an attention to detail as Tommaso was talking about. It's that detail and that engagement with the detail that not only um, explains things, and I, I agree the capacity for people to understand things should never be underestimated, but also there's multiple modes of telling those stories some of them could be an immersive installation and other things could be a workshop with someone like Jacob who regularly um, comes to work Gadigal Murray and come and work with us regularly as do many other groups so there's lots of modes of engaging in those story uh, stories I think that the detail and the um, the moving between the modes does bring hope it gives um, not only uh, clear action like planting um, certain grasses or so certain trees in our regeneration programs, but also the sense that um, documenting um, through a drawing project or a photography project, um, reflecting on how other artists have engaged with nature, 
bees are in the natural environment and even changes to the natural environment um, really allow a, a complex and nuanced response to nature, which also brings uh, hope, but also brings a real, real impetus for action. I mean, I think if those things are embedded in the back of your mind, then next time you're going to, the more we build that up, the more we have energy for action, whatever that might look like from the smallest things to the biggest things. So hopefully Bundanon can contribute to that by being a platform rather than necessarily leading it, but building a space for it. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Um, Tomaso, maybe back to you. Um, yeah. I mean, you've sort of, you were sort of leading into that with your last answer. So what is the what, answer? How do you, what's what, your, how do you suggest yeah. how we can contribute to a more sustainable future? I think, I think to me, there's two parts to that, uh, two parts to that question. There's one is what can I do as an individual, uh, as a member of a society uh, where I can make certain choices about how I choose to, uh, to live. I can make certain choices about what I choose to eat how I choose to travel uh, and, and sort of uh, uh, how I choose to contribute my time in my, in my, in my spare time. So I can, I, uh, th there's all of these personal choices which can collectively add up and have a real impact. Uh, there, there's there's uh, sort of abundant research now suggesting that particularly in sort of the, the global north, um, if we were to switch our diets to something which is more plant-based and not entirely cutting out meat, but more plant-based, that would have a really substantial impact on, on our carbon emissions and in terms of our ability to sort of leave space for nature uh, on, on a global scale. So there's, there's things that we can do individually. And then I see a role more as a, as a, as a scientist, part of a, as a scientific community. And, and in there, my role, I see it as, as one to sort of shed light uh, and try to really, uh, going back to the concept of stories, trying to unpack some of those stories, trying to understand how uh, the climate is changing, how uh, ecosystems are responding to these, these changes and what the scale and, and pace of these, of these changes are. And ideally also the, the last step of that, of that thing is what can we sort of concretely do about that? Give me examples of planting trees. I'm not in at all saying that we like planting trees is a bad idea. We we absolutely need to be investing in in restoration uh, and thinking about how we can restore some of these degraded habitats that we've created. Um, but it's a uh, it's about doing that again with that with some of that nuance and hopefully some of the science that we do can contribute to uh, to, to that kind of discussion. Um, and so yes, yeah, so I see those two roles really for for myself. Okay, great. And Lee, perhaps you could make a comment on suggestions for a more sustainable future. You have to unmute yourself. Oh. Is she there? Yep. Um, I was saying the natural world has repeatedly sent us signs that it's in trouble due to the negative impact humans are having on the planet but we're only now starting to receive those messages in a way to cause us to change our thinking and behaviours. Well, I don't think it can be stressed enough the importance of bringing Indigenous educators back into the fold and of having rec government recognise and integrate Aboriginal knowledge and land practices to help with climate change and severe weather impacts across Australia. I think Australian growers could maybe begin to use bush tucker plants, which are far more suited to the Australian conditions. Um, and by returning to Aboriginal sustainable land management practices, um, removing flowering plants from commercial greenhouses would um, allow insects to have um, more freer access to plants um, and increase pollination of, of our food plants. Insects themselves are a vulnerable group um, as I think it was Tomasi, Tomasa mentioned before, um, a much vul a vulnerable group, less able to escape the warmer temperatures and um, they are, they're a primary food source for numerous animals and pollinators and both numbers are already in rapid decline. Additionally, I think using natural fertilization methods rather than the addition of nitrogen rich commercial products 
used by intensive market and commercial growers could produce healthier soils and reduce the on runoff which pollutes river systems and waterways. Um, I suppose basically prioritising more organic farming methods. The importance I think is being evidence right now, especially as we're witnessing such devastating floods in New South Wales and Queensland in these recent weeks. So I think it's all about collaboration, sharing best practice between communities and learning to live in harmony with nature and its systems restoring balance and living more peacefully with the natural world. To learn from and reincorporate Aboriginal practices which had previously been successful for thousands of years. Thank you, Lee. Um, Andy, would you like to give your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm, I mean, basically, I'm just going to rehash kind of what was said in the last question, really, uh, by everyone. And just to emphasise, I, I think that my sense is that one of the ways we can contribute to a more sustainable future is, is to tell more stories. It's to tell stories from across all of our disciplines, telling stories in different ways and at different times for different contexts, because, of course, you know, one story will not impact um, all individuals or all contexts in the same way. So finding ways to, to work more to synthesize different ways of storytelling for me uh, is a really important um, way of, 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 of contributing to that more sustainable future. I think that onus comes down to us as individuals too, that, that we ought to tell stories. We should tell stories to people um, who live in different places about the nature that we know. We should tell stories um, about the nature that we once knew to, to younger generations. So keeping those oral traditions um, alive, particularly in cultures where oral traditions are less firmly entrenched, um, I think is, a, is really important to, to maintain that emotional connection um, to, uh, to, to our connection to the, to the wider world. So that's one strategy. Um, I, also, I also think that in, in the telling of these stories, young people, as Daniela, I think, mentioned earlier, ought to be at the front and centre of that work. So in a 2021 study from last year around eco-anxiety, three quarters of respondents aged 16 to 25 felt that the future was frightening. Meanwhile, 64% of young people said that governments were not doing enough to avoid a climate crisis. So as well as actively addressing this and developing strategies to transform fear into action, we need to, I think, work with young people so that they are the ones collecting and preserving and being empowered through the collection and pres preservation of those stories about the world. They, I think, can, can be the ones, and we can find a way to encourage them to, to communicate stories in new and exciting and cross-disciplinary ways and it seems to me that that's particularly important because I, th I think only by by receiving stories and retelling stories can can we um, as individuals find new ways to imagine how the world could be and how we could adapt ourselves and the world to the challenges that undoubtedly lie ahead. Thanks Andy I'm sure um, Jacob, Jacob will be able to um concur with what you've just said. I'm interested in hearing his thoughts because I'm sure, as he said before, he's been hearing stories since he was a little boy. And I guess I was thinking that, you know, children are influenced by everything around them and the environment itself sort of acts as a third teacher as well. So Jacob, if you'd like to contribute your thoughts on that question. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Andy that um, all of us are telling our stories our way is the way to move forward, but also that coming together, as we, we talked about today as well. Um, like, say, like, always we'll talk about science and accepting culture, you know, but I hope you're uh, glad to hear that, you know, when we do my talks, I talk about the perpetual motion of the boomerang, um, you know, the, the um, what would the trees breathe, you know, the, the oxygen and carbon dioxide, so we adapt from that science and put it into our talks and our education and our stories as well, because it gives us, it makes it more credible, like we are saying before. Um, I could talk about the fires, traditional fire management, to talk about uh, looking after the country. Uh, but for me personally, 
um, again, I agree with Andy that the kids are the way to put forward. Um, you know, in our culture, we call the land mother, uh, mother, mother nature. Um, it's called mother because it provides, you know, it also protects, it gives us everything we need, it gives us life. But you have to love mother. And teaching that to the children is one of the biggest things because our love comes with protection, comes with respect, comes with understanding. So all those things will come from when these most children learn to love nature. And when we teach kids how to love and connect with nature, it doesn't mean going out and giving the tree a hug. It's, it's not like that. It's not about you know, respecting it, understanding of what it does for you and what you can do for it in return. So, you know, we take the kids out and we sit them, we do the smoking ceremony. We'll take them out and sit under a tree. And then we'll talk about what fire does, the different types of smokes, what it does to you. Um, the black smoke, our black smoke is not good for your lungs. It's, it's bad smoke. And what the white healthy smoke does from burning certain leaves. We talk about that. We tell them to take a deep, big um, breath in and then breathe out and then explain to them that that tree that they're sitting under just gave them that breath. And the breath that they breathed out just gave that tree that breath. So they are in harmony, they are connection, they are keeping each other alive. And you see that the kids and they see just a little spark of, oh, really? That's mine. And so little things like that is how we move forward. Um, you know, once you see the land as mother, as a family member, not just as there's something for you to take advantage of, as, as resources for you to use, it's there's something to keep you alive and you need to keep it alive as well in that harmony and keeping that connection and balance. It's a huge thing and the only way forward is teaching the children that and that's all children from around the world have to get out and connect with mother they have to go out and learn about the bush they, they go out they have to get dirty they have to go out playing on mud they have to go out climb a tree and fall down all those things build memories positive memories once you have positive memories of those things you love it you respect it you want it like it is i want the my children one day to go through the same things i did as a child run through the bush having fun and so it's all about, for me, that's where it all started. My dad taking me and my cousins going out and playing hide and bush and um, hide and seek in the bush. That's what it was. Going out and once I learned that I could have fun in the bush, I loved being out in nature, then I wanted to be out in nature more. Once you're out in nature more, you want to protect it more so you can keep going to it. And it's a gift. So you, you want to expose people to it. You want to take them to the bush. You want to take them out to nature and show them all the gifts that Mother Nature has to offer. And um, not just to live, but um, survive, but to thrive as well. And that's for all of us as well. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people say, a lot of people say our culture, a lot of aspects are lost. It's never lost. Um, it all came from Mother Earth in the first place. All the animals, all the plants, all that knowledge that took thousands of years of sitting down listening to learn about it. Um, it's still there to this day. It's never lost. It's just there waiting for us. Unfortunately, we forgot we've forgotten it. Um, and so you, that's for everyone around the world is to take that on. And uh, the best way forward is always with the kids, teaching language through the kids, um, anything. They are our future. So if we get them on the right track, then yeah, hopefully they'll fix a lot of our mistakes that we left them for. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. Um, really um, appreciate that. And that's all about, sort of like you said, emotional connection, taking the time to understand we are one with nature. Um, Daniela, would you like to end off on this question? Um, be interesting to hear your thoughts following what Jacob's just said. I fully agree with Jacob. You don't protect, but you don't love. So it's important. But I'd like to challenge us further. Is sustainability, a sustainable future the right term? Because sustaining, if you look at, I'm not a native speaker, but you know, in, word, in stories, words are important. And sustaining talks about you know, being able to maintain at the current rate. Do we really want to do that? Sustaining also says to defend, and there will be places we have to give up. We will have to give up because the ocean will take land back. We have to give up because nature needs more space to be preserved, to have pollution reduced so that it can provide us with the services. Is sustaining really what we need to do? Maybe we don't know the right word yet. You know, we, we in the report, we play, we've reflected a lot on, on climate resilient development, but do we want to be resilient or do we just sometimes just want to give up? And that's okay as well. Mm. And so I think it's important to think about 
how can we adapt? How can we reduce the risks from climate change and from biodiversity loss by enhancing biodiversity, by mitigating against emissions? And how can we make the world a more, you know, again, sustainable development goals? You know, that we, we're using this term all the time and I'm not completely sure that we really reflect on what we mean. I think it's important that we understand that for whatever future we want to form, partnerships are really important. Doing it with the people who live at a given place, considering their knowledge, and that's local and practical and indigenous and scientific and all of that has values. It involves groups which are marginalized at the moment in these discussions and prioritize equity and justice. Because if, if the world we are creating isn't just, the whole exercise is pointless. And so I think it's really important that we consider holistically, you know, from poverty to biodiversity loss to climate change and bring all of these things together and empower people to create a world. Let it be sustainable, resilient or whatever term you choose. Okay. Thank you for that, um, Daniela. <clears throat> We've just got a couple of questions that have come through. So um, I don't know who'd like to comment on this. Maybe you would, um, Daniela, I'm not sure, but um, from Anna Glynn, just wondering if planning seems to be based on election cycles that we should encourage governments to plan for 500 years and not just three years. Make the story, make the story for an ongoing story. I agree with the fact that we need to ensure if you're not planting a forest for the next 20 years time. And so we need to consider what the world will look like. If we're building coastal flood defenses, again, we're building those for the long term. But you can also flip this around and say that every bit of a planning cycle is an opportunity. If every decision we make about new infrastructure, new houses, new parks, new forests are considering uh, an equitable, just, biodiverse, climate adapted world, it's gonna be a better world. And so I think those, those opportunities, if it's, you know, in, in Europe, it was called the, you know, the, the post-COVID green investment, some people call it net zero, some people call it various things. If we consider, and if we also consider how much money was mobilized over the last two weeks, on a geopolitical crisis, climate change will turn into one of those geopolitical crises. Um, <clears throat> Danielle, could you also maybe quickly touch on when we spoke earlier, it was quite interesting that when you were telling me about different forms of greenwashing and, um, you know, there was, you said to me, no, that doesn't, that doesn't make a difference. Could you give a few quick examples about greenwashing just for some people who, like myself, perhaps weren't aware of that? I think Tommaso gave the best example. You know, everyone is talking about planting trees. And if you plant them on a peat bog in the UK, and if you do that in, in Scotland, and there is a lot of space in Scotland, some of which is reforestation where trees were before. And that's absolutely the right thing to do. Some of this in Australia, nor on a Scottish peat bog, is planting trees a sensible thing. We also need to think about the fact that how many people say, oh, I'll offset my flight by planting. The tree, that tree is not going to stem. Um, but I'll hand over to Tommaso because he knows much more about forest than I do. Tommaso? Yeah, so I think, I think that one of the one of the big sort of criticisms or pushback that we've seen from the scientific community on this idea of, tr of planting our way out of a climate crisis, this sort of like simple silver bullet kind of solution is that there's a real risk that because we're not considering any of that nuance that I was trying to sort of talk about, there's a, there's a risk of, um, of opportunities for people to use it as an excuse to not make progress and action on the things that we really need to make action on. And I sort of like, 
so sort of it becomes sort of like a smoke screen for what I am, at least in my opinion, are two of the biggest things that we really need to make action on. One of them is drastically reducing and cutting down on uh, fossil fuel uh, use uh, so that essentially leaving fossil fuels in the ground. I mean, there's there's wide consensus that 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 is the first and foremost thing that we need to do to get to a place where we are cutting down emissions to a position where uh, we are not pushing ourselves beyond that 1.5 to 2 degree Celsius warming, which is, again, an agreed sort of limit, upper limit to where things start to get really, really bad above, above that. Um, and we're close to that limit already. Um, and then there's the other side of it, which is we can't only just rely on cutting down emissions, but we also need to find, find a way to re remove some of that CO2 from the atmosphere. And that's where things like restoration and tree planting can play a, a, an important role. Um, they're not going to solve the, the by itself. But again, there's this worry that if we focus exclusively on tree planting, we forget that equally important, if not more important, is keeping current ecosystems that are intact, intact. So we can't deforest a piece of land and offset that by planting trees right next to it. It doesn't work like that. That carbon that's in that forest is lost immediately and immediately put into the atmosphere. And it will take decades to centuries for those new trees to make any meaningful impact and sort of re-equilibrate on, on, on that. Um, so it's it, I, I almost, greenwashing is one way of it. I almost see it more like a smoke screen, but there's this sort of, sort of this worry that you're dangling the tree planting in front of people as, a, as an opportunity to then keep doing a lot of the things that we know we cannot afford to do anymore. Right. And um, maybe just lastly, a question for Lee and Jacob. How, um, how do you both see um, uh, beneficial ways perhaps of sharing um, when you can sort of your knowledge and um, working with different sectors to ensure that um, such valuable knowledge is, um, is sort of incorporated into different areas so that we have more collaboration? I mean, I know you've both worked with lots of different arts organizations. But how do you see the role of perhaps more corporate enterprise or different community groups being able to collaborate in a way that um, sort of the broader public can understand and hear more about your sort of traditional knowledge and approaches to um, creating more balance and interaction with the, with the natural world? Either of you like to talk about that? If you can hear me. Okay, um, well, from the um, Botanic Gardens point of view, we do have a community greening program with um, some Aboriginal um, horticulturists. Um, they go out to disadvantaged communities and um, help um, with funding and with expertise in setting up community gardens. Um, they can be fruit, veggie sort of um, gardens, or they could be um, sort of non non indigenous plants, um, if if depending on the use. But it's a, a wide range of community groups. It could be preschools or schools setting up kitchen gardens. It could be old age, like senior citizens, community centres, um, and it's looking at developing mental, emotional well-being as for for the people as well as for the for the environment um, by establishing more that these gardens. They're hoping that um, the no, the knowledge is spread within the community um, as well as the the well-being of of the people. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Jacob, did you have any thoughts or? Yeah, um, so with um, uh, me and my cousin's business, uh, Garden Group Murray, uh, we work also work in tourism, so and with uh, consultation, so doing like our staff development with companies. Um, so that could be from any sector of, of any business, it doesn't matter, government or private sector, um, going out and doing staff development, seeing the days out on bush. Um, where they start to see all those connections and learn about some bush tackles, some bush medicines, stories for the place they're living in. And um, that, that 
coming together. Um, and then we've also, you know, working with our private landholders as well. So we got a um, partnership with a private landholder up in Kangaroo Valley. And so we do our uh, robberies on their property. So we'll invite people to their, to their property and we'll put a big property on our robbery. So then we're establishing ourselves in the community, the greater community as well. So it's like, if you need to talk to someone about this or you want to talk to someone, um, a lot of hard times for businesses and governments and private sector is um, knowing who to talk to and finding the best person to speak to. And so by um, putting ourselves out there as much as we can and saying like, if you want to sit down and have a talk, then that's what we're here for. That's what we love to do. And so um, connecting people like that and creating partnerships, um, whatever they may be. Um, and it's not always, you know, like, oh, we, we need help, we need help. It's about, you know, we can help each other out. So um, the farm that we're working on, they want to um, set themselves up as a healing place. So it's a place where people can come and um, connect the country and get away from the city and healing. Um, so we'll help them with their, some of their knowledge about the bush tackle, bush medicine, put the strawberries on for as well. It, it brings it all together. And so creating partnerships is the way forward. Um, it doesn't, no, no partnership, good partnership is one side. Um, they have to be beneficial for both parties and that, that's just being realistic so and there is things that um government private sectors is people that want to get involved and land, landholders there is things that you can get um, benefit from partnering up with aboriginal people and communities or companies um it's not always a one-sided thing um and if it is it's not a good relationship so uh it has to be beneficial for both parties um to move forward yeah um, yeah, um, I completely agree. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Well, look, I'm actually um, conscious that we're um, probably now out of time, but I wanted to thank all of you um, for sharing such um, provoking knowledge and insights and being so generous with your time. I think we all probably recognize that these ideas are always unfinished because um, they strive to reflect a future that we seek, which is, as Jacob was just saying, necessarily collaborative. So it's certainly my hope that all leaders can be inspired to act as agents of change and everyone, no matter what sector you may be in, can explore the ways we can all successfully resource our work to, uh, to move towards collective gain and positive transformation. Um, also a reminder that we might send you an e-survey link in the next 24 hours. We'd appreciate you taking a few minutes to complete the questionnaire as it will greatly assist the British Council's evaluation of the UK Australia season. And keep an eye out on social media or the respective websites for the next two iterations of this project, which focus on new frameworks of cultural engagement and climate education. I think all that remains for me to say is to thank the British Council for supporting us today, uh, the wonderful teams at Bundanon and the Cabot Institute for the Environment, our amazing speakers, and to everyone watching, thank you for staying with us and enjoy the rest of your day. And um, stay safe, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>